Hey guys, Boston25 for launching the launch of Star 1D2. Now we're on 5. So it's one, one minute away from the launching. We hear the DDO. This is the DDO speaking, announcing different steps. Right. And we will have the countdown within a few seconds. We have 45, 45 seconds from the liftoff. 40 seconds away, wow. And I guess everybody over there is concentrated. Yeah, and look at them on in. Sitting next <laughs> to minus 30 me. seconds. <laughs> really I live that so many times. You don't know all the things that can happen. So <laughs> I'm really focused. It's difficult for her because she has information on one side. Yeah, uh, talking to her. 15 seconds away. To the DDO, attention for the decamp final. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, There it goes. The quiet arms. 3, 2, 1. Allumage Vulcan. Allumage Vulcan. Allumage UAP. There it goes. So impressive. Armet à bord nomino. Well, we have just seen Ariane clouds. 5 disappear towards space. Do stay with us, everyone, because what's nominal. going to happen next is as crucial as the next launch. This is, of course, the moment when the two satellites, Star 1D2 and Utilsat Quantum, separate from the launcher and are placed into orbit. But that's not all, is it, Baptiste? Uh, yeah, I guess it's not all. I was really uh, watching at those impressive, uh, <laughs> impressive mages. And uh, to answer your question, I'm going to uh, uh, ask uh, Amandine. So, Amandine, uh, how many kilometers does uh, Ariane 5 travel before nominal. the launching of the satellites? So, in fact, uh, Ariane 5 is not going to go to the GO orbit, uh, this orbit of interest. Uh, that would be quite a journey. So, we yeah. are going to the GTO orbit, so the GO transfer orbit, uh, which is uh, an ellipse around the Earth. Uh, which uh, lowest point uh, is close to the Earth. And so this is where the upper stage is going to get us. We will reach roughly an altitude of uh, 650 uh, uh, kilometers. And this orbit has an interest. The highest point is located at the same radius of the GEO orbit. And so that will be up to the customers once they are released into the GTO orbit to get to the GTO orbit and to do the final maneuvers to circularize the orbit and be in the GEO orbit. I guess and I hope everything is uh, calculated and programmed. So what is the role of the team in Kourou right now? So everything is pre-programmed on board, but you remember I talked about the onboard computer. So the launch vehicles knows exactly where it is, where it is located, what is its acceleration and velocity. Yeah. And so it will reach the orbit by recomputing the orbit every time in order to get the maximum performance and the best accuracy. Right now, the main active people in Kourou, you don't see them, they are in the ground. We did have an important event. I have the confirmation that we have the EAP separation. The booster separation. Yeah, the booster separations. Yeah, booster have been separated. So that's at 2 minutes 20 is the time when the two boosters leave the rocket. Why is it specifically 2 minutes 20? Could it be earlier or later? Yes, it can, because I was talking Operation about nominal, the trajectory nominal. And so you trigger the separation of the boosters when you do no longer need them. So that means that they have done the job in showing most of the, the, the power that you need uh, to escape from, uh, from ground. Mm -hmm. And so by recomputing the trajectory, there is a point at which you know that they do no longer push because the acceleration is low. And so the onboard computer is going to trigger uh, the separation of the boosters. And so it roughly, usually it happens within a, a few seconds in comparison to the prediction. And now we will be witnessing the next step, I guess, I hope. Which is the fairing separation. I did have the confirmation, so now it's the separation of the fairing. So the fairing uh, was there to protect the satellites uh -huh. from the acoustic at, in ground because the liftoff uh, creates a lot of noise and from the atmosphere, as, as it was mentioned uh, by Mathieu and uh, Raphael. And so we separate the fairing, same, the onboard, the onboard computer, we compute everything, knowing exactly what is the velocity, what is the altitude. It can recompute the flux 
And when we are under the threshold, the maximum uh, flux that we authorize for the launch vehicle and for our customers, the onboard computer triggers the separation of the fairing. Okay. I guess now, more or less, uh, RN5 is uh, out of sight. Uh, how will we keep the link? How will Kuru keep the link with the rocket? We will keep uh, the link uh, with the rocket uh, thanks to a network of one station. Uh, which are in uh, visibility with the launch vehicle. They receive what we call the telemetry of the launch vehicle. Telemetry are the key flight measurements uh, from the launch vehicle. And you have a team in Co. you were asking me the questions, mm -hmm. which is located in, uh, in the first station, the one in, uh, in Galio. And they will receive all the telemetry oh, of the launch vehicle. They will process it, analyze it, and make sure that it, it is coherent uh, with uh, what was the forecast. And they yeah. will give us and give me and give the DDO tonight uh, all the, the main milestones. Okay, so they're analyzing the data. Exactly. Okay. And after that, the launch vehicle will be tracked by uh, another uh, uh, network of stations. So it will be followed by Natal in Brazil. In the Atlantic Ocean, we will have Ascension. We'll talk about that later because Libre I Bilian, think we will Kenya. follow every step. Yeah, we will. We understand that the launcher is in full flight now. So what is its speed? What is its altitude? How fast is it going at the moment? It's showing so it right, right there. So right now we are at an altitude of uh, roughly uh, 160 kilometers and the speed is above uh, 3 kilometers per second. And okay, so when to explain the audience, you have all the, the numbers, yeah, all have, the data in front of you. We do have the data. And so what is uh, worth uh, mentioning is that uh, now the mass is uh, only of uh, 160 tons. And before it was, what, 775 tons? Yeah, so enormous. reason which, for which we separate uh, these boosters, because uh, simple rule in space, the yeah, lighter the better if you want to get faster. Okay. Lighter, higher, faster. <laughs> okay, I understand. Um, <laughs> it makes me think of a song. Daft oh. Punk song. Yeah, but that's it's same for me. Side, <laughs> side, uh, side subject. Uh, Mathieu, uh, let me ask you a question. When we were preparing this show and uh, uh, we were talking about the VA254. Yes. So what is it? A code, secret code? It, it's indeed a secret code. I cannot communicate on this, Baptiste. <laughs> no, no, it's, uh, it's uh, the numbering of the flight we're considering for V for vol, A for Ariane, obviously, so Ariane flight. Uh, 254, but uh, what's interesting is that this counter started uh, 41 years ago with the first flight of Ariane, which was Ariane 1, in 1979. On the 24th of December. Uh, December, yeah, yeah because huh? we launched on Christmas Eve, <laughs> when yeah, necessary. Nice. Was, uh, the birth of Ariane was on uh, Christmas yeah. Eve. Very nice, so for uh, Christmas time, you watch uh, the launching of the rockets. No, so it's I, kind of a good present. Yeah, but I was not born. <laughs> I'm a bit surprised. No, I was born a, a, a month later. <laughs> <laughs> so now we are following uh, the next steps and uh, we are about seven minutes after the launching and uh, very soon and now we were talking about the, the, the bases on the on the ground on earth which uh, are linked to the to the to the rocket so now who are we linked to where are we linked to we will probably approach natal uh, we will uh, approach the visibility of uh, natal yes indeed and so it's, that means that uh, we are along the path uh, away from, the, from the, the American coast. Okay, so what is Natal? Natal is a ground uh, tracking station uh, in Brazil. In Brazil, yeah. Yes. And so now we're waiting the DDO announcement that would uh, specify that uh, Natal uh, is linked to the rocket. Yes. I did not Any news? And so no. what well, just that, that happens. As far as I can tell, that seems to be an issue on Ariane Spass's end.
post because it's a cryogenic engine and it's not a given for it's always uh, an intense moment so because yes, the uh, main, cryogenic the uh, engine uh, is being in the dropped. space conditions. So now we enter the second propel phase uh, with uh, the upper stage uh, that will get our customers to the final orbit, the GTO orbit. Okay, well, thank you very much, Amandine. We keep on focusing on all those uh, important formations. Thank you, Amandine. Thank you so much for all that. Well, we are now less than 20 Under minutes away from the separation of the first satellite, and of course, we'll be going live from the Jupiter control room in Kourou. But for the moment, let's now focus on today's passengers. Two telecommunication satellites. How do they work? Well, the answer is in this short report, guys. To understand how a communication satellite works, you'll need to get the bigger picture. A satellite is made up of two parts. The service module, or bus, is the part that contains the equipment necessary for its operation. The other part is the communication module, called the payload. This is where the antennas and electronic equipment are located. Information is sent from a ground station, which then transmits this information to a satellite in the form of high-frequency signals. These signals arrive in the transponder, which receives and transmits the signal. They are then sent back to one or more other ground stations and relayed by antennas or cables to the end user. Looking up at the sky, we could notice that some satellites remain fixed and others move quickly. This is because they are not located in the same orbits. A satellite that remains fixed is in the geo orbit for geostationary. At about 36,000 kilometers in height, at the equator level, it revolves with the Earth. This is why it seems to be fixed in the sky while it is moving at three kilometers per second. At this altitude, the satellite constantly covers a very large geographical area that never changes. To serve specific applications, geosatellites will need a hand. Some of them need a latency that is extremely low. Latency is the time needed for the signals to reach the satellite and return back on Earth. Less than 500 milliseconds on the one hand, less than 50 for low Earth orbit, LEO satellites. But as they are lower, between 400 and 2,000 kilometers of altitude, they move faster and cover a limited geographic area for a short time. They are then operated in constellations. Well, uh, Raphael, watching this report, we understood that uh, the future of satellites is in a way in constellation. And we've been talking before the show, and I was talking to you about uh, Jeff Bezos and, um, and, and, uh, and Elon Musk. Uh, Elon no, no, Musk, Elon right. Musk and Jeff Bezos. I heard they plan to send more than 45,000 satellites. Mm -hmm. My question is, is there enough room over there? Well, just look at the sky and you can see that it's vast enough to host like many, many planes, for example. And space, it's much better because the more distance from the Earth, the more space and volume you have to, fill, to be filled with satellites. Um, it's not an issue in geostationary orbit because it's very far from the Earth. In LEO orbits... Yeah. Low Earth sorry, orbit. To, so, sorry yeah. to interrupt you, uh, uh, Amandine. What does it mean, Natal? Yeah, Natal. So that means that uh, we have uh, the acquisition. Yeah, it was it was uh, as it was planned. So we had the acquisition. Okay. So yes, there is, uh, there will be a, a, a gap of visibility, but that's completely planned. That's normal. Okay. And so during this phase, which is a quick one. Uh, all the data will be recorded on board, okay. and so they will be transferred uh, down uh, to the next one station. Uh, Acquisition de la télémesure par la station d'ascension. So Ascension will recover uh, what, whatever has been downloaded, and it will yeah. be analyzed Project by the, the team crew. Well, okay, everything is perfect. I'm sorry, uh, we can go back to that question. Is there enough room over there? Yeah, I, I was saying that the uh, low Earth orbit is more like conditions, and I, I think that the, the main issue is to really set common rules in order to regulate the traffic, like we do it in, on the road and on the seas and in, in the air, of course. And um, the main ch challenge um, is to do it in a sustainable way. And um, yeah, in order to really avoid the satellites to uh, collide with each other, that would generate uh, many debris 
And of course, that's not good in order to uh, continue to do activities in space. OK. And uh, just one quick question. Uh, I feel I have everything I need with my phone. What satellites and constellation can give me more? This is because you live in Paris, a big city. <laughs> and so, yeah, no, I mean, uh, satellites are like a very good, e even in big cities, actually, satellites are good solutions to uh, bring re re resilience to terrestrial uh, networks. But it's also a matter of sovereignty uh, for states, and this is why the European Commission is working on its own uh, constellations of satellites in order to bring internet connectivity to European citizens. Okay, well, thank you very much, Raphael. In less than 15 minutes, we'll go back to uh, Operation Room in Kourou to watch the next stage of the mission. That will be the separation of the first satellites from Ariane 5. But before this, let's now focus on something which we are all eager to hear more about. Of course, I'm referring to Ariane 6. Ariane's group Next Generation Launcher. Let's look at this report and we'll talk about it afterwards. So sit back and enjoy. Now this somewhat interests me. Four kilometers from Ariane 5's launch pad, the future is well underway. Here at Ariane 6's launch zone, it's been a hive of activity with its new impressive mobile gantry built on the launch pad and Ariane 6's assembly building. Work was carried out on 170 hectares of land surrounded by a tropical jungle which now hosts the launch complex Ella 4. Thierry Vallée is the site manager for Kness. We are now actually entre the bâtiment d'assemblage lanceur and the zone de lancement sur la route qui relie donc les deux installations. A giant mobile gantry has been built. It is 90 meters high and 50 meters wide and weighs in at 8,000 tons. It is heavier than the Eiffel Tower. The inside of this structure will be used to protect the workers in case of bad weather while they assemble the launcher. Le portique d'Ariane 6 a cette particularité d'être mobile parce qu'il a besoin de pouvoir être déplacé de 140 mètres vers le nord pour dégager les lanceurs quelques heures avant le décollage. The infrastructure is already well underway yep, and since April tests have been carried out in the spaceport, as you can see from these impressive images. Around the launch table, 60 valves must open in less than a second to let 30,000 litres of water gush through per second. The launcher donc euh, émet des gaz chauds à plus de 3000 degrés et génère des vibrations à 180 décibels, donc c'est à peu près 1 million de fois le bruit d'un marteau piqueur. Et donc on imagine bien qu'il faut protéger les, les installations de toutes ces agressions de, lors du décollage. Les 900 mètres cubes d'eau qui sont nécessaires au déluge viennent d'un château d'eau qui conserve donc cette eau à plus de 80 mètres de haut. After the launch, the water is pumped and sent to a water treatment plant. Tous les paramètres naturels de l'eau vont être vérifiés et contrôlés. Et au bout de deux semaines environ, donc l'eau pourra de nouveau être relâchée dans le milieu naturel. In the meantime, the launcher is also getting itself ready. Ariane 6 has just passed its biggest technical challenge to date, the engine, oh, engine tests, test, which were all successfully completed. That's good. Tous nos systèmes propulsifs ont terminé leurs essais de qualification et on a maintenant devant nous la démonstration que ces systèmes propulsifs fonctionnent dans leur environnement du système lanceur général. Ce sont les essais à feu à Lampolshausen et en Guyane. Et les deux grosses innovations, c'est sur les, les boosters à poudre avec une enveloppe composite et l'APU. Ce système cryotechnique euh, de la multi-rôle est unique au monde et on l'a inventé dans le courant du développement. At the foot of the rocket, the P120C boosters, which also equip the Vega C launcher, can be integrated with either two or four boosters on Ariane 6. They provide thrust during the first 135 seconds of flight and ensure escape from the Earth's atmosphere. The second engine, the super powerful Vulcane 2.1, is the main stage engine and provides a thrust of 140 metric tons. Then comes the turn of Vinci, the upper stage engine. It's reignitable and enables improved precision on all types of missions and towards all orbits. The fourth motorized system, the auxiliary power unit, is the rocket's major asset. It enables payloads to be deployed into several orbits. This is crucial for satellite constellations. Pour le lanceur lui-même, on a défini l'architecture du lanceur. On s'apprête à déposer la définition que l'on va qualifier pour aller en vol. Et à côté de ça, on a commencé à produire les, les, les étages. Un premier étage supérieur et sur son banc d'essai à Lampolshausen pour réaliser des essais à feu 
dans les semaines qui viennent. Et on réalise également le lanceur qui va partir en Guyane en septembre pour réaliser les essais combinés du sol et du bord. In Karoo, the interesting European Space Agency, which funds and manages the entire Ariane 6 program, supervises the work carried out by Kness and Ariane Group. Ici, nous nous trouvons devant le, le BAL, le bâtiment d'assemblage lanceur d'Ariane 6. The agency is the architect of the project and is the main link between Europe and Guyana. Dans ce bâtiment, nous intégrerons à l'horizontale, contrairement à ce qu'on faisait sur Ariane 5, les oh, deux okay. étages, cœur central d'Ariane 6. For the moment, this is just a mock-up at the launch pad. Once the technical qualifications of the rocket elements are completed, Europe's spaceport will start its combined tests. Pour ces essais combinés, nous aurons les premiers éléments maquettes, mais des vrais éléments lanceurs qui viendront des Mureaux, de Bram, etc. ici en Guyane, s'interfacer avec les éléments du sol développés par le CNES. L'objectif, à la fin de ces essais combinés, c'est l'autorisation de la première campagne de lancement Ariane 6. In Ariane 6 schedule, this is the last step before its inaugural flight. Welcome to the living room, Rotor Spaces Living Room. Nominal, Raphael and Mathieu. Mathieu says you have been working for the Ariane Group and you are more specifically working for Ariane 6's development program since day one. Ariane 6's maiden launch is programmed for next year. Can you tell us a bit about what technical changes have been made to this Ariane as opposed to Ariane 5? Well, I'm very happy about this report because you could really get an overview of everything that's, that's new. And uh, you could see the facilities we have and the new means. And with, uh, with this, we'll be in. able to, to operate, it's manufacture, assemble uh, the launcher in, in a cheaper and a very efficient way. This is a really a big change. Also, the fact that you could play with a number of boosters, uh, either with two or four boosters, means that uh, with RN6, you actually have two launchers for the price of one. And uh, finally, the big game changer to me is uh, the upper stage. The upper stage, uh, cryote cryotechnic upper stage with Vinci and APU engines uh, that we can reignite in orbit. And from there, uh, like it opens so that is many that perspectives think the in terms of missions. Yeah, I, mean, I, I agree with you. We can do like many, many type of missions to any orbit. Um, it's also important because you can actually do right share mission. You can accommodate as many satellites as you can under the fairing and to separate them in different locations in space. And of course, this is very important to deploy these constellations of satellites. And to the moon? Yeah, as a matter of fact, we are preparing the first European mission to the moon with Ariane 6. It's going to happen during this decade. And we are also preparing a mission to Mars. It's going to happen in 2026 with Ariane 6. We will, bring, we will send a space probe to Mars. We will catch the Mars samples um, that, that was yes. collected by Perseverance, and we will bring back to Earth in 2031. Uh, so this is very, very exciting perspectives. Thank you so much, you two. We're now going to go back to Baptiste, who is with the representative from the European Space Agency. It's back yeah. to you, Baptiste. Yeah, thank you, Anna. Uh, thank you, Emma. Yeah, sorry. Good, good evening, uh, Daniel Neuswander. Welcome to Road to Space. You've worked all your career in space industry, and you are today the Space Agency's Director of Space Transportation. Uh, in the last report we saw, the Next Tech report, we, we saw that RN6 is now turning into reality. Can you tell us what was ESA's role in the development of the launcher? Yes, good evening to all of you. And uh, ESA's role in the development of RN6 had basically two main functions. Number one, we were the development procuring entity, and second, we were the launch system architect, as you just said it in the film. Uh, this means that we define the high-level requirements, we adapt the institutional uh, needs for the future of this uh, launcher, and we accept the deliverables, the deliverables that, which is the rocket on the one side, provided under prime ship of Iron Group, and on the other side, of the launch base uh, provided by We bring it together at the occasion of the combined test, where we uh, manage them through the definition of this combined test, where it has to have a perfect synchronization of these two elements, and we uh, verify that this happens before we go to liftoff. Well, thank you very much, Daniel. Next to you, we have uh, Marie-Anne Claire, the director of the Guyana Space Center. Marie-Anne Claire, do you hear me? Yeah, nice to see you. 
Uh, yes, good evening. We saw also in the report those uh, new buildings have been built for the upcoming launcher. How many people were involved in such a huge work and huge construction? We, we started the construction for the new launcher IN6 in uh, uh, 2019, so uh, it is uh, 3,000 people which are working on the base to adapt uh, it, but not at full time, and we have a peak in 2018 with uh, 600 people. And today we are around 200 people which are working still on the ELA4 in order to start and to prepare the combined test as explained by uh, Daniel before. Well, thank you very much, Daniel. Thank you very much, uh, Marianne Claire. We'll uh, come back to Co a little bit later. Now we go back to a uh, live sequence because uh, we are approaching uh, a critical or important uh, sequence, uh, Amandine. Uh, in some, a couple of seconds, the DDO would normally confirm the switching of the engine of the, on the upper floor. This is the information you're waiting for. Yes, we are waiting uh, for the shutdown of the upper stage engine. So that means that uh, we would have uh, reached the final uh, injection orbit, the TTU orbit. So it's a critical and really important moment. It's an important moment. So that means that uh, we have uh, finished uh, the, the, the propelled phase. which means they are just going to be, I don't want to use the, the phrase drifting through space. What happened in the Okay, so we had the confirmation that, uh, yeah, yeah, so the, the upper engine has been cut off, and so now we are in orbit. Okay. Oh. So, as we, so, so as we say, uh, so far, so good. Thank so you very far, much, so Amandine. In a minute, we'll be uh, focusing on our uh, social networks and answering your question. Just before, let's have a look at what's coming next. Satellites being deployed. That's Tonight what. in Road to Space, we've just witnessed the launch of Ariane 5 and two telecommunication satellites. Shortly, we'll be answering all your questions from social networks and taking a look at the science fiction film Stow Away. We will ask our experts is it really possible for an intruder to get aboard a rocket? How long was I out? Please, I gotta go back. We're not going back. What do you mean we're not going back? This is a two-year mission. Fact or fiction, stay with us for the next uh, part of Fun Road fact, Space. Scott Manley was involved in that film. Raphael and Mathieu, well, we're back, and we have another question for both of you from our social networks. As you know, our time is limited because in less than four minutes, we'll be going back to Kourou, where all the team is waiting for the next step of the mission, the first separation. But... I've got another little tweet from Arthur du Abmir, who's asking us about the Kessler syndrome. Now, what is the Kessler syndrome? Well, um, this is a theoretical scenario according to which um, the number of space debris um, in low Earth orbit reach a point where it creates like a chain reaction, um, leading to so many debris in orbit that we would actually not be able to use space anymore. But thankfully, uh, in Europe, we have a French space law, which is ruling the way that we are performing the, uh, our launch missions uh, in a way that uh, we uh, are observing the best practice in order to really make launch services in a most uh, sustainable approach. Yes, um, indeed. So I just told you about the fact that uh, you, can, you can reignite the upper stage of RN6. Mm -hmm. We'll be able to do that, which means that at the end of the mission, once you've deployed the, the satellites, you'll be, you'll be able to reignite the Vinci engine or the APU uh, to perform a deorbitation, which means that you remove the upper stage from its orbit. So it means basically that at the end of the mission, we clean behind us. Yeah, the, the, the Kessler syndrome, the, the, the Kessler effect you're talking about reminds me of uh, the first sequence we had in the, the, the movie Gravity. Is it Ex the same this thing? This is exactly uh, the type of um, catastrophic event. Oh, oh, <laughs> you're doing more studying movies than... Uh... We, we are not there yet. Uh, <laughs> okay, thanks to Thomas Pesquet. Well, thank you very much. We are, uh, thank you both for all this information. Thank you very much. Uh, we have uh, more questions for you, and we will try to answer... Uh, all of them by the end of the program. But now it's time for us to focus on Embratel satellite Star 1 G2, which is just about to separate from Ariane 5. So we're waiting for this uh, moment. Should, and Amandine, you will tell us? Yeah, I will tell you. For the moment, we are doing all, all the maneuvers necessary before the separation of uh, the satellite. Uh, it's what we call the, the space ballet. 
So you want to get to the right attitude, the one desired by the customers, the right spin. And I did have the confirmation of Star 1 D2. Star 1 D2. We, are, we have separation. Well, Star 1 D2. So far, so good. Let's go back right now to Kourou, uh, where normally Cyriel should be linked with us. Cyriel, are you waiting? Are you, do you hear us, Cyriel? Well, we can see all the faces in the, in the Jupiter room. Everybody is really concentrated. Ah, yeah. Cyriel, it's good to see you. What's, what's, what's the atmosphere Yes, welcome there? back, Betis. Well, actually, as you can see, uh, still tensed. We just got the confirmation of the separation for Star 1D2, but let's remember that we still have a second passenger on board, and the mission is not over just yet. So that's why you see that people are still working, concentrated, and we are waiting for the next update. Well, thank you very much. So we, we could say that half of the job is done, mm. main part of it, but we still have a big issue. Uh, and this issue, Amandine, we, uh, we are going to talk about uh, the, this first separation um, with you, Rafael. But just before, Amandine, can you tell us more about Silda? Okay, the Silda is uh, the black cone that you can see uh, on the animation. Uh, so that's uh, what we call uh, the dual uh, launch structure. And that allows us to perform the dual launch configuration. And in fact, what you want to do is to make the most of all the performance available. Uh, I did have the confirmation of the separation of the SILDA. SILDA. So the SILDA is uh, the structure that allows you to embark two satellites that want to go to the same direction. Yeah. And in fact, if we want to talk about innovation, that's somehow a precursor of uh, uh, the next right share mission. And now we will perform the next maneuvers in order to get to the right attitude and orientation for a telsat control. Thank you, Amandine. Now, if I can come back to you, Raphael, and talk about the first separation that just happened. For the operator on Bretel, this must be such a relief for all the teams over there. They were under such a lot of pressure. What do you think? Yeah, of course. I mean, like uh, Cyril and Amandine said, Ariane is actually uh, designed to do dual launch, so we are separating two satellites in orbit. Baptiste said that uh, we, half of the job uh, was done. Actually, we have three separations. The first satellite, the SILDA, yeah. and the upper, um, the lower uh, satellite. Uh, it means that I, I can let you imagine if the SILDA is not rightly uh, separated, yeah, you, you can, you what's can... going to happen when we try to separate the, the, yeah. the last satellite. So, of course, everybody is still focused on the, on the rest of the mission. Yeah, actually, yeah, we, we are focusing on the satellites, but yeah, there's the seal dies. I mean, if, if, you, if it's still there, I guess you can't free, you can't separate from the second satellite. You have some problems, yes. Okay. I can feel well, before we focus you on the You're still separate, of, uh, but you have a satellite, satellite floating in the seal quantum, The second satellite, we are going to take you on a journey, on a voyage. Uh, we are going to watch the trailer of the science fiction film named Stowaway, and then we are going to try to answer a question called a uh, passager clandestin, an intruder, an illegal intruder gets into a rocket. Let's watch the trailer of the movie. Hi, Michael. I'm Marina Bunnett, the commander of the ship. Do you remember what happened on the pad? I'm a launch support engineer, ma'am. How long was I out? We took off about 12 hours ago. 12 hours? You need to get back to my no. sister, please. My sister, she's alone, please. I've got to get back. We're not going back. What do you mean we're not going back? This is a two-year mission. Two years is a long time to be away, but this is the opportunity of a lifetime. That was, well, welcome you both back to the fact-checking segment from Roads to Space Living Room. I have with me, um, I'm just going through the trailer, and for all of those of you who haven't seen it or haven't seen the film, maybe I should put you back in the picture of the summary. It's the story of a three-person crew on a two-year mission to Mars and the dilemma they face when an unplanned fourth passenger suddenly arrives on board, what we call the stowaway. So my first question, obviously, to you both is, is this a plausible scenario? I really hope not. <laughs> no, it, it, if it happens, I really would um, advise the launch service provider to uh, rethink its processes because it's all about processes, right? Yeah, if you think about uh, when manufacture the launcher, 
everything is checked because what, one of the risks that we fear is what we call uh, foreign object damage. Okay, so that we have a, you forgot a screwdriver or a tool, anything, and it damages uh, the rocket during the launch. So everything's monitored. Yeah, and every, every tool is labeled, and uh, you have a specific team who is taking care of uh, making sure that uh, nothing is left uh, inside the yeah. launch vehicle. So everything inside, okay, but what about outside? I mean, we are in Karoo, for God's sake, mm. it's a tropical jungle out there. <laughs> what about mosquitoes flying around? What about animals? <laughs> okay, yeah, I can confirm. Karoo is wild. Uh, yeah, when you're, you're there, when you're uh, dealing with a huge integration holes, uh, what you fear is that uh, some birds, for instance, get inside the buildings. This is why we had to hire also an animal specialist, specialist oh. in animal's behavior, uh, who is in charge of when we open the door to place traps, uh, to actually make diversions with uh, flashlights, etc., in order to prevent animals to yeah. come in. What about dust particles getting into the top of the satellite? Yeah, e even a speck of dust is an issue for us. So that's why uh, the, the air is filtered around the, the satellites and, yeah. and clearly monitored. Yeah, and for scientific payloads, it's even worse, like the James Webb Space Telescope that we will be uh, we will launch uh, at the end of this year. I think we have some images here of the yeah. Cumulus Curtain. Um, you know, a, a speck of dust is, uh, would really like damage ah, the mission and uh, make uh, this telescope blind. You see that here, they are using UV lamp in order to really detect dirt there. If, for example, if you're proud of um, the cleanliness of your bathroom, just uh, light it up with a UV lamp. That's right. And pr I promise that you will never want to shower again there. Why would you do that? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, guys. Well, now I know I'm reassured that there is no way an intruder can get into an Ariane 5 rocket. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we're going to go over now to Kourou and go over to um, Baptiste, who will be talking about the separation of the Utelsat quantum. Let's go over to him now. Yes, Emma, in less than uh, 10 seconds, you, uh, well, yeah, more or less 10 seconds, Utelsat Quantum uh, satellite should be released from Ariane 5 launcher. So that's really a crucial point. We're waiting and we should see the people happy and clapping if everything is turning good. And that should be on the. Yes predicted time, 10 seconds so away. We had the acquisition of the white attitude. Okay. So here it's quiet, but lots of things happening over there. We had this, yes, we had the separation of the Delta Quantum. So that's yeah. the end of the, the mission for, for the launch vehicle. Okay, so uh, we hear people clapping. I see your face. I see your face, Raphael, uh, and Mathieu also. So I guess this is... In a way, the end of the mission. Let's go back uh, immediately to uh, Kourou to see uh, the atmosphere over there. Yeah, you can see the team Check. cheering up, clapping. Check. And now uh, we should be linked uh, with uh, Stefan Israel. Stefan Israel, are, are, are you there? Stefan Israel, CEO I remember of Stefan Israel is the CEO. Oh, me, with you. Okay, yeah. <laughs> you still have your mask, but I, 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 can, I can figure out a, a huge <laughs> smile. Yeah, Whoa, yeah. Nice. So you're happy. Good news. And good yes, customers. I'm very happy, customers. but I am happy for my customers. Yes, for sure. You've been no, it's very important for our customers. Uh, uh, well, well this, okay. is this is why we are launching satellite, because we have a little so, yes. delay between yes, uh, Stefan and me. And, uh, well... You were talking about your happy customers. I guess it's really important for you. Yes, it's very important for uh, Ariane Space because it was the first uh, Ariane 5 uh, of the year and uh, it had to be a success and tonight it's a great Wait, success. First of the year, very Jesus important Christ, for July. us to pay the tribute to all the contributors of this success. Wow. We have uh, our prime uh, Ariane group. We have here with us uh, CNES, which is our daily partner in CSG. We have ISA. It is a success of uh, the whole European team, for sure, Ariane Space as well. And for our customers, Brazilian customer on Bratel, French customer Utelsat, very innovative satellite, Maxar, American manufacturer, Airbus Defense and Space, European manufacturer. Tonight, it's a victory for all of them, and I really want to thank them for their trust to Ariane Space. And it's, it's a great start for what you call the Ariane season, because it's just the first launching. 
Yes, it is the first of the Ariane season, and you know that now we have two very important Ariane 5 uh, w which are about to be launched. One will be for SES and uh, French DGA, and the other one for, for James Webb Telescope. It will be the climax of the year. And we have also, during this summer, a very busy summer, we will have Vega for Playa Neo for Airbus on August 16th, and then a Soyuz from Baikonur on August 19th for OneWeb. So it is also the beginning of a busy summer for all our teams. Well, thank you very much. Good luck for a huge uh, job you have uh, during the summer. Uh, and we'll be watching, definitely, we'll be watching the next launching. Thank you very much, Stefan. Meanwhile, let's take a moment to answer one last time the question sent by our audience, and it sure Thank is a headline you, topic we've kept Thank you. Video. Let's take a look with our first tweet from Astro Hayden, who I believe is a, is a boy, is a guy. Greetings, Aryan Space. I'm very excited for the future with advancement of technology capabilities. How far are we away to one day launching humans on an Ariane rocket? Yeah, that, that's a question for Ariane. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But I can confirm it's a boy, actually. Uh, we, we know well. It's that's a right. boy. Yeah, during lockdown, he, he made very good uh, use of his time because with his parents, he built uh, an Ariane 6 model, which is uh, very, very nice. So, so he, he's probably one... He will be maybe sitting on your on your chair uh, on your chair. Yeah, and, and maybe he'll build uh, <laughs> a rocket that bring a human to space. <laughs> and yeah. I'll tell you why because I think we have all as uh, techno bricks to go to space. What do you need? You need to to have a reliable launcher with high performance. That's what you'll get with RN6 because we'll be able to launch uh, more than four astronauts to to space with the performance we'll get. And you need to be able to re-enter from space. It's something that has been demonstrated uh, with the IXV program. It will be done with the Space Rider. Something that we master. And then there's a final brick. Which would be, uh, can you do a, a capsule? Can you do a spaceship that goes to space? We did that uh, five times, launched by Iron 5 with the automated transfer vehicle. Uh, but we are still doing things on, on that topic with Orion, for instance. Yeah, we can mention that ESA is uh, implied in the uh, Orion module, which will bring humans back to the moon, actually. Whoa. Yeah, so I, I actually really agree with you, Mathieu, <laughs> that uh, Europe has everything needed to do this. Uh, the experience, the technology, and the motivation also. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, and as a matter of fact, also in a more commercial perspective, um, this, is, this market is getting stronger and stronger. Today, uh, with astronauts going more often into the, the ISS, that is where uh, our European hero, Thomas Pesquet, yeah. is actually uh, He's running watching, some experiments. watching our live now. I hope, I so. hope yeah. he is watching us, <laughs> yes. Hello, Thomas. And, um, and tomorrow, many more astronauts going to the moon. And so, yes, just... Let me ask you a stupid question. Why should we go, human go back on the moon? Ha, for many, many reasons. First of all, because I was not born when it happened yeah. before. <laughs> okay. So I need to do this yeah. live. And um, the, the moon is also very uh, scientific, a um, lot of scientific uh, interest. Because um, we went there, but um, we didn't, uh, we went to uh, very few locations on the moon, and we brought back samples that are, are very limited, and the moon can really um, um, bring us knowledge on how the Earth was formed, but also the Moon has resources on the surface. You can, for example, transform the regolith, which is the, the, the dust that is covering the surface of the Moon, into water or oxygen. So it really gives you the conditions to uh, really dream of a sustainable presence of a human on the Moon. And you can also dream of um, transforming it into fuel in order to fuel rockets oh. that would lift off from the moon and go deeper in space, for example, Mars, but even deeper than that. So lots of very exciting perspectives on the moon. That's a dream. That's yeah. a dream. <laughs> we had another question on social yeah, media. Yeah, um, we had one from Roman, Batman he's called, is the Aaron Sang <laughs> officially him. certified to fly humans? Yeah, yeah, I think it refers to the fact that uh, RN5 was also initially sought uh, to, to be flying Hermes, which was the European uh, space, uh, oh, the uh, Hermes, space that's ship a, somehow program that's that a blast uh, the past didn't happen. But uh, there's a good point about this, is that uh, the re high reliability you have with RN5 is actually uh, in the DNA of the rocket because of this ambition. So it has not been, uh, it has not been certified per se for human spaceflight, but uh, still we somehow inherit from it. Okay, can we, have, uh, can we dream big and... Uh imaging, for example, a space uh, station like uh, the ISS around the moon? <laughs> this is, this is yeah. not a dream. It's actually <laughs> happening. Yeah. Like, you know, you know the, the ISS, the International Space Station, is going to come to an end. 
And the states that are investing in the ISS are thinking and building right now uh, Lunar Gateway, which is like an international space station around the moon, uh, in order to make this sustainable presence of a human astronauts uh, around the moon a reality. And Europe is actively participating to this, uh, to some module of these of this, uh, space stations. So yes, you yeah, need yeah. to be to to, to dream bigger. much yeah, bigger. But right? you bigger. Dream, well, but we'll please. have a lot of topics to discuss on the next show. It's really <laughs> oh, yeah. interesting. Sure. That's a key. That's a, that's a question that is uh, you know interesting everybody. Yeah. Thank you very much, both of you, for all this uh, information. And uh, we are now going back to Kourou uh, to see how the teams are going and to meet some uh, really happy customers, I guess. Hello, Cyril. Uh, it yeah, I'm just going to turn the studio here. Place. I'm about 25. That was the launch of Star 1D2 and Utah Quantum. Goodbye.